everyone. Excited to be here. Um, so my name is Naeem Ishaq. I am the CFO at Checker. Um, I live in Denver, Colorado uh, with my wife and daughter. Most of the time I'm there. Way too often also in San Francisco, but that's a separate personal problem. Um, Checker is a late stage venture backed company that's disrupting a large global market in background checks. And we've been doing this for about 10 years now. Um, I also sit on the board of directors of Checker.org, our philanthropic foundation, and of Foodix. It's another late stage growth company as well. So as we dive in here, as mentioned, I've worked in Czech now for over 25 years, not 20. I feel old even saying that. Um, and I started my career when I was 19. And like many of you in the room here too, I was also an entrepreneur. So I started a small consumer internet company during the dot-com boom. It didn't succeed, which is why I'm standing here with you and not on an island somewhere, unfortunately. But it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Um, and I've had the great success to be a part of so many category creating companies over the course of my career. Those include companies like Intel, Salesforce, Circle, Checker, um, and, and many more. And folks often will say things like, Naeem, you've been so fortunate to have a seat on the rocket ship at so many great companies. And yes, it is true. I've been super fortunate to be a part of those stories. At the same time, um, you know, it's, it's timing matters a lot here too. So I joined Salesforce in 2008. We were at the moment uh, a pretty small private, or pardon me, public company, but less than 2,000 employees, less than a billion dollars in revenue. 16 years later, that business has obviously grown except, uh, exponentially. I also joined Square um, as a mobile payments company in 2012. At the time, we had less than 200 employees and the growth has been staggering. I mean, like 10,000% increase from when I was uh, initially there. Um, it is today a multinational, multi-product company that's a category creator as well. Uh, and then lastly, I joined Circle in 2018 at CFO. That's a less known company these days. It is private, so you know, can't disclose too much in terms of numbers. I can tell you it has also seen really phenomenal growth as well. So it seems like this is you know, the story of a rocket ship. And yes, that description very much does hold. That said, for so many of you folks here in the room, you know that the reality is not like a rocket ship, right? Because rocket ships go in what direction? They just go up. And how do they go up? Continuously, right? Reality is nothing, nothing like that. It looks more like this. The reality is like a roller coaster, um, not a rocket ship. And roller coasters are fun, they're exhilarating, but they're also really scary and chaotic, can be even unpredictable. And you know, as I've talked to so many operators and founders here in the room, you know from your experiences here, that's what it's like as well. So you remember that rocket ship story I said earlier? Let's uh, double click and see what the reality was like. I joined Salesforce at a time in 2018. I didn't mention that was like April of 2018. Uh, pardon me, 2008, not 2018. What happened later in 2008, in the fall? Something, something brothers. Lehman Brothers, global financial crisis, it was really, really bad, right? The market crashed, our stock crashed by like 65% in just a matter of weeks. That was not a lot of fun, the total bloodbath. And then Square as well, I joined um, just after our Series D and just after we had signed a massive contract with Starbucks, which was also massively loss making. That wasn't a lot of fun either. And Circle, I joined just after uh, it had, Bitcoin had reached an all-time high at the time of $17,000 a token, and then proceeded to crash by like 80% in a matter of weeks as well. So our revenues at Circle, which is a crypto company, dropped by more than 90% from our peak run rate. So that, that was the reality of the experience. So why am I sharing that with you guys? Uh, mostly because I'm a masochist. I love to have PTSD here on stage with everyone, but no, no, all kidding aside. I think the stories from this experience, you know, I certainly learned a lot. I hope you all can learn a lot here as well. Um, so my story here uh, is also a story of these three folks. You might recognize some of them. Mark Benioff, the co-founder and CEO of uh, Salesforce. Jack Dorsey, the co-founder and CEO of Square. Uh, and Jeremy Allaire, the co-founder and CEO of Circle. Um, so we're going to tell uh, this story through their experiences. I hope you all can learn a little bit about that as well. So we're going to start with Salesforce. As I mentioned, I joined in 2008. Uh, Salesforce was not the behemoth that it is today. Um, I remember reading headlines very vividly about how 
uh, no company, no proper enterprise would ever trust its, its data, its private data, to a third party. Folks also made this argument that you can never stream your applications effectively over the internet. Um, and people also, especially financial folks, would claim and argue that the model of running software as a service was fundamentally flawed and would always be unprofitable. All right. So today we know none of those things are true. With hindsight, but at the moment, that is what we were experiencing. Um, even the term cloud computing hadn't really caught on at that time. So that was the backdrop. Now, our CEO, Mark Benioff, had this incredible, incredible, unshakable vision for where the world was going. Um, it was so, uh, so much conviction around that that the way we planned our business, and I kid you not, was it just assumed that we had unlimited demand. Which, I don't know if any founders in the room here, if you're ever in a place where you have unlimited demand, this is a good place to be. So the way we planned our business is we just said, okay, how many account executives can we hire in a given year and ramp them up successfully? And that was it. And you know, we did our TAM analysis and we looked at you know, how many customers would buy and what that looked like. And Mark always concluded, yeah, I'm glad you did that, but the market is actually much bigger than you expected. It's going to grow faster than you expected um, and we're going to crush it even more. So that approach, kind of looking at just you know, capacity to deliver more than demand, did work really well for the first nine years of our life as a company. But then unfortunately, 2008 hit. And 2008 was brutal. You know, how many of you were working professionals in 08? From the show of hands here. So about half of the room. It was really, really hard. The stock market crashed, job losses went through the roof. And there was also this like, very palpable fear that permeated nearly every household in the US and then spread across the world as well. So that was a very, very tough time. And for the first time, Mark's conviction in our market started to waver a little bit. And so we made some decisions. We actually cut back on hiring, we cut expenses, and we slowed ourselves down. Now, years later, at all hands, Mark shared with us as employees that he had one big regret over the first, uh, at that point, 12 years of the company's history, is that we slowed down hiring in 2008. And you know, the lesson here um, that we took away is, you know, even when times are tough, you can't lose your conviction. Right? If you're on the rocket ship, like truly Salesforce, if ever there was a company that was there, um, you need to still double down on that conviction. And a lot of folks here are in this mode of being on the cutting edge of this next revolution, right? AI, and a lot of folks are probably working in that space. There's probably a frothy bubble that's emerging. Maybe valuations are a little bit out of control. Maybe they're not, it's hard to tell. But you do need to have that conviction. And even when times are tough, you need to make sure that, that you're not shaken away from that. Otherwise, you'll really sub-optimize your opportunity as a company. Now, with hindsight as well, we can see that things worked out OK. You know, Salesforce has 08, that little tiny bar, much, much bigger bars now. So I think we can give Mark and the team at Salesforce a little bit of a break. Things have worked out just fine. The next story I want to share with you is about Square. So Square is a mobile payments company. Um, when I joined in 2012, we had just raised $200 million in our Series D financing. Uh, at, well, at the time, it felt like a massive $3 billion valuation. Now, the initial product, the Square Card Reader, was a total sensation. Before Square came to the market, the idea that you could buy, I don't know, a $2 taco using the American Express card was crazy. Like, absolutely crazy. But with our free reader, easy to use software, easy onboarding, we made that a reality. And that took the market by storm. So the business was growing really fast. Things were great. Investors were happy. But our CEO, Jack, had a much, much bigger vision in mind. Jack was insistent that Square would be more than just a small business payments company, which was our whole business, right? So it's kind of radical to say we want to go do more than that. And he was obsessed with the idea that we would be serving consumers as well as small businesses. Which, you know, as a co-founder of Twitter, probably not too shocking that he'd want to go do that too, but he's really, really insistent upon that. Now, our first product that we had um, towards the consumer product uh, market was called Square Wallet, and it was a failure. Wallet just did not have the density needed to be able to pay with your phone in the way that we had envisioned. Now, keep in mind, this was six years before Apple Pay had launched, so we were very much cutting uh, at the bleeding edge at the time. Um, so that led us to think about, well, what could we do to drive that wallet adoption? 
and, and that brought us to Starbucks. Um, so Starbucks has some of the highest uh, transactional volume of any retailer in the world. And we had this idea that by partnering with Starbucks, we would be able to get enough merchant density that the consumer product would start to get the flywheel spinning and ultimately will start to take off. So um, we developed a partnership with them, but in order to get them to do so, we had to effectively make them an offer they could not refuse, which is what we did. Um, we made them an offer where we would process payments for all their uh, American stores below cost. Right, low cost. That's kind of crazy. We talk about like doing billions and billions of dollars of transaction volume, but that is the context that we stipulated, and it kind of worked. It worked in the sense that Starbucks <laughs> they did sign the contract, and the partnership did take off. But you might be wondering, well, what happened next? Their CEO uh, Howard Schultz joined our board, and we went off uh, and started processing payments. Um, unfortunately, it didn't really work at all. So number one, the losses were staggering. So staggering, in fact, that all the money we raised in our Series D was wiped out, like gone. This is $200 million, right? That's to give you some sense of scale, $200 million. So we go, oh, okay, well, that's not good. And you know, like, we might need to raise another round here. So we, we got busy on the finance team and started raising a round. And also actually at the time, the markets were not great, a little bit reminiscent of how they are now. So it was a very, very difficult uh, market uh, for us. Uh, and then even worse, because we were losing so much money, tensions between the companies got pretty tough. And so what was supposed to have been this like, really deep strategic partnership, it wasn't that way. And Howard, the Starbucks CEO, even left our board after just barely a year. So that was not great. And then maybe <laughs> sort of the real kicker here is like adding insult to injury, is it did nothing to drive wallet adoption. <laughs> In fact, uh, Starbucks never really even deployed that solution in their store. So it's just like, we wasted $200 million, we have all these losses, that was really tough. When it came time to doing our IPO, um, and I was drafting the S1, I had to mention Starbucks 46 times in the S1. 46 times. And not in a positive way with the customer. This is like, oh, you please ignore all these losses over here, look at this over here, and it's a little bit of a tough sell. So that was a very, very challenging situation for us as a company. So you might be thinking like, well, that was a, a crazy situation. We never should have gone after the consumer market. Uh, but the lesson is not that. The lesson here is quite different. Jack remained persistent in his vision that we would grow beyond being a B2B payments company. He even changed our mission statement from this thing we loved, you know, make commerce easy, it was this beautiful, simple statement. He said, okay, that's out. We're not gonna say our mission is to expand access to the economy. Which I'll be honest, not all of us loved, right? So it's a little bit of a controversial thing for us. Um, and then Square Wallet did fail, but out of that grew a new product with that conviction remaining committed to that market was a product called Cash App. And some of you might be users of Cash App as well. It's a, it's a great application. And so we were doing all these things in the background, but times were tough, we were losing a bunch of money at Starbucks deal, cash was starting to run low. We had to make some really hard decisions um, in terms of how we would spend our money, which also caused tension internally because folks working on the core business were kind of envious about this other like, small business that was burning a lot of cash and they were taking away resources. So Jack on several occasions actually had to go in and defend the emerging products. Now this story also has a, a happy ending. So fast forward to where we are today. These are the most recent results for Square. Uh, its last quarter, it generated $1.3 billion of gross profit from its cash app business. $1.3 billion in one quarter. By comparison, its core business where we started only generated $900 million of, revenue, of gross profit. So its core business uh, is actually now smaller than the new thing that we had built. And many of you would know from experience in the history of business of all time, it's really rare that your second act actually outshines the first act. This was one of those cases. So I think the key lesson that I took away from this is you have to be focused on investing in the short term, or pardon me, in the long term, even when times are tough. And so yes, we did several things to extend our runway. We put a hiring freeze on most functions at the company. We killed several products that were new but not really hitting its milestones. We you know, had to hold ourselves accountable towards that. 
Um, and we rationed capital really strictly against some very tough, unique economic measures so that we could direct that capital back towards other new products and really build this massive enterprise that we wanted to go and do. So a really important lesson for all of you there too. So that's gonna bring us to Circle next. Now, Circle is not quite as much of a household name as say Salesforce or Square might be, uh, but it has long been a pioneer in the crypto ecosystem. In 2018, when I joined, uh, its business, its revenues, were based entirely upon crypto trading. Whether it's its exchange called Poloniex or its trade desk called Circle Trade, Circle made money when traders traded. Right, it's a simple model. So more trading, higher vo volumes, higher transactional uh, token vo uh, values is good for the business. And things were really good at that time. We were making at a run rate like over a billion dollars of revenue. So things were, were great and very, very high growth. Um, unfortunately, again, Bitcoin was coming off this massive, massive run up, right? Around 2017, any, any crypto folks here in the room? Remember? Bitcoin hodl, some, fewer than I said, there we go, I got one here in the room. So, at that time, Bitcoin going from a few thousand dollars up to 17,000 was like mind blowing. It's a little bit like what's happening now, which is great, 92,000, last time I checked, five minutes ago. Um, so, so that was really good for the business. And there were also new blockchains that were emerging like Ethereum, and that caused this like incredible frenzy of excitement and frankly speculation in the crypto markets. So that was the business at the time. Unfortunately, it didn't really align with the vision that Jeremy here, our CEO, had from the beginning. So there's this dissonance between what he wanted, right, which is this idea of being able to move money as simple as sending an email. And these new technologies, these blockchains, in theory, could enable that, but our business was focused on trading, not upon like financial infrastructure. So that was a big gap. And then again, the market crashed, right? So in 2018, Bitcoin went from 17,000 down to about 3,500. You can see that in this chart over here too. And on top of that, not only did the price of Bitcoin and every other token drop by at least 80%, some were like 99%, but also volumes went down. So double whammy, right? If you're a trading business, volume and prices going together, your revenues would be even further down. So it was, as they say in crypto world, the crypto winter has set in. Uh, and it was a very, very cold winter for us. Um, but that said, despite that, we had to keep fighting through. And I'll be honest, like this was an incredibly, incredibly humbling experience for me and everyone else at Circle. We went from being incredibly profitable with incredibly high growing revenues to incredibly unprofitable, like overnight. It was shocking. I'd never seen anything like that in my career. Um, but we had to keep our calm, we had to keep our resolve, and we had to keep our focus. So we immediately went out doing things like cutting expendi uh, expenditures and sales and marketing is the first thing to go. It wasn't enough. Then we had to look at, well, can we cut our staff? And for anyone who's ever had to do that as a leader, there's few things harder than having to let go of your colleagues, uh, especially when it has nothing to do with the performance, it has to do with the business. But we had to do that over and over. And yet things kept getting harder and harder and harder. Cash was getting lower and lower and lower. So a difficult place to be. So we were left at a crossroads. On the one hand, we could just hope that the market turned around and keep at it, which was the consensus view. It was looking pretty tricky. Or we could try to do something more radical. And ultimately, we did choose the latter here as well. So at the same time, the Circle team kept building and building and building. Uh, and we're working to develop a solution that tied back to our original vision, the idea of moving money over open rails. So we launched the full, first, world's first fully reserved uh, regulatory compliant and transparent uh, cryptocurrency uh, uh, um, called USR coin that was backed by the US dollar. Uh, you might say it was as easy as moving money uh, over the internet. And although that product, USDC at the time, had like almost no revenue, we did have conviction that this was aligned with our vision. So we bet everything on that. And as part of that bet, we literally sold off almost all of our assets, which meant we took our revenues practically to zero. We sold off our exchange, we sold off our trade desk, we sold off our consumer app, and we bet everything on USDC. That was not easy. It did give us enough capital to continue to fight and hope for a better outcome. And this story also, thankfully, <laughs> has, a, has a good ending. 
um, USDC took off, it exploded, absolutely exploded. And as interest rates rose as well, revenues came up quite dramatically. Today, US dollar coin has over $35 billion in circulation. Billion with a B. And Circle and its partners make roughly 5% interest income on that balance. So you can do the math, right? Revenues at Circle have never been higher, and it is absolutely as dramatic of a turnaround as I've ever seen in my life. So I'm super, super proud of the team there. So I think the key lesson here is you've got to set yourself up to fight another day, no matter what it means. Even when it means like burning down all of your ships in order to, to build for something greater, uh, that was my big takeaway and something I think certainly hopefully can be an inspiration for all of you too. So to wrap up, I want to leave you with some practical uh, guidance on how to extend your one way for the startups that you're leading today. Number one is a kind of an obvious statement, but you need to make sure that you don't wait too long to fundraise. Um, you know, it's like the old saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Making sure that you've got the runway in front of you is really critical here. And the general rule of thumb is you want to keep at least 12 to 18 months of cash ahead of you at all times. Now, it takes typically at least three months to meet investors, to pitch your business, three months to close around. So that means you just kind of work backwards. You should probably start fundraising when you have 18 months of runway. Which sounds like a long time ahead of when you need the capital, but trust me, I've raised over a billion and a half dollars for the various companies I've worked for. The earlier you start, the better off you'll be because you actually have leverage in the conversation. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Number two here as well is just be really careful about adding fixed expenses, right? So like office buildings, committed contracts, but most importantly, adding people is really critical here as well. It is so easy to find the temptation because your teams, if, if you know, CEOs here in the room, constantly b being told by your teams, like I need more people, I need more people, I need more people. But the reality is you can get a lot out of the folks that you have. And the marginal return on the people you hire is often pretty low. Right, so there's a, in, if there's any engineers in the room, you might be familiar with Amdahl's law that talks about, you know, what is the incremental speed up you get in a compute system by adding more resources? Adding people is kind of like that too. So if you double your team from 10 to 20, your output is probably not going to 2x. It might not even go up by 20%. It might even go down, right? Because you have to ramp them up and you have all this like coordination tax. And so staying lean, is so, so important. And I think this generation of startups that are growing up in this kind of tougher fundraising environment are starting leaner, which is great. But during zero interest rates, that was not the case at all. We saw a lot of really out of shape companies that just kept adding resources. So avoid the problem itself. Be really careful about adding resources. Uh, number three is a little bit of an obvious statement here too, but an important one to remember is that to the extent you need to cut, cut once and cut deep. Um, and if you're faced with laying off staff, you know, it's demoralizing to do layoff after layoff after layoff. Now, I know we all know this, but none of us, or very few of us actually followed this advice because it's painful. It's really, really painful. Um, I have a friend, uh, Gokul Rajaram, who's a, a successful investor and a famous uh, product leader. He wrote on LinkedIn recently that prioritization is not real until it starts to hurt. And if you're cutting staff and it doesn't really, really hurt, you know you did not cut deep enough. So when you go through this process, you need to go really deep and make sure you don't have to do it again. The next piece of advice here is that when you go through this process, you want to make sure that you prevent what I'll call like the inverted pyramid. A normal and healthy organizational structure looks like a pyramid, right? You have fewer people at each layer, typically by a factor of five to 10 as you go up and up to the top. Um, but staff reductions typically happen the, the opposite way. Right? So the CEO and the CFO or director of finance, whoever, sits in a the room, they say, hey, we need to cut 20% of the company. They then give a target to their teams. They say, okay, I need to cut 20% of my staff. They give it to their teams. What happens at the end? Where do you cut? You cut at the bottom, right? So this pyramid kind of becomes a diamond and maybe even flips over. So you don't want to have that happen where you become really top heavy. So you need to pair the reduction with a really careful evaluation of your leadership structure, how you actually operate as a business, and then number two, pair it with a, a careful evaluation of span of control, right? The number of employees that report to each manager. Almost no company does this. Almost no company does this. And it's so obvious, but if you're in a place where you need to go through the staff reduction, please, please, please make sure you do this process as well. It's just doing a, a top-down target and a reduction as well. 
Uh, and then finally, I want to make sure it's important to touch on your working capital, right? So working capital is the amount of capital you have tied up when running your business on a day-to-day -day basis. So you can think about this as like diff the difference between when your customers pay you and you have to pay your vendors and your employees. And so the two sides of that equation, you know, number one, like when you pay your vendors, it's tougher with your employees, although maybe you can negotiate that. Um, but with your vendors, typically you have like net 15 or net 30 uh, payment terms. Going to like net 45 or net 60 is often as simple as just asking. Asking over and over, demanding, setting expectations when you do a contract renewal. It's like, hey, you know, we only pay, use these words, we only pay our vendors on 60 term, uh, net 60 basis. Whether or not that's true, <laughs> it might be an aspiration. Um, and eventually, especially in this environment where there's so much pressure on sales teams to close deals, they're becoming more and more uh, accepting of these payment terms. That's number one. And then number two, carefully evaluate how you bill your customers as well. If you can find yourself in a place where you can pre-bill for like an annual contract, that's incredible. Maybe even a multi-year contract, that's even better. But you know, using working capital can prevent you from having to take an extra round of financing, increase dilution, and ultimately diminish shareholder returns. So with that, I hope we found that helpful. I wanted to thank you all for your attention here today, and I hope to see you all at the rest of the flush. Thank you very much. <laughs>